Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well, and of course Arnie does too. Now in today's video, I will be continuing my invasive fish series. But yet again, today's a little different, as I will be going through three invasive fish species, but also be going through one invasive mussel and one invasive mammal. But before we start, I'd be interested to know if you guys wanted to see videos on other invasive species, and not just aquatic species, as there are plenty of invasive species around the world, and I've only really covered the species that can be found in rivers and oceans. So if you'd like to see me cover other invasive species that aren't aquatic, then let me know down in the comments below and I'll probably put out a poll too. But for our first species we'll head to the fresh waters of North America, Europe and Asia as we have the northern pike. Now there are plenty of fish in the pike family and they all look very similar to each other but the northern pike is one of the largest in its family only really rivaled by the muskie and these two fish are so closely related that they can actually interbreed and create the tiger muskie and in its native range the northern pike is at the top of the food chain preying on almost all other freshwater fish apart from the species that are much larger than they are and you really do have to be a big fish to not be targeted by the northern pike as they can reach a maximum size of around 1.5 meters or 59 inches and there's a reason why this species can be found over three different continents as they're one of the best ambush predators in the world's fresh waters and although the european pike and the north american pike are the same species the european pike tend to get a little larger and the reasoning behind this is thought to be that they don't have as much competition in european waters as they do in american waters and the story of the northern pike being invasive is quite a strange one as in a lot of the countries where it's invasive, it's also native, as the northern pike is native to the US, but only in some states and regions. And it's the same story up north in Canada. And one of the places where it's causing the biggest problem is Alaska, and the northern pike is actually native to the majority of Alaska, but it isn't in many parts of the south. And in these areas it can cause massive problems, because as they're top of the food chain, they affect everything else below them, and can cause sport fish populations to collapse. And it's thought that this predatory fish is spreading because of illegal stocking, because the northern pike is very popular with anglers, so some people may think that it's a good idea to stock them in lakes where they aren't found. And this can be a very costly mistake to make, as in the US fisheries are a big industry, as it's thought that the Great Lakes fishery alone is valued at more than $7 billion annually. And although the Alaskan fisheries aren't worth anywhere near as much, the consequences can still be devastating. And because of this potential threat to the fisheries, and also the native species, if you were to transport a live pike from one ecosystem to the other, it's not only illegal, but it's classed as a class A misdemeanor, with a $10,000 penalty. And although this may seem harsh, this law is in place to help protect the native species. But for our next species, we'll stay in the fresh waters of North America, as we have the American mink. Now minks are in the same family as weasels, badgers, otters, ferrets, and martins. And the members in this family are known for being very hardy, and they're also known for being great hunters. With some species such as the weasel being very famous for taking on prey that's much larger than they are. And the American mink shares this fearless personality, as they feed on a wide range of animals, such as mammals, birds, fish, and crustaceans. And when it comes to invasive species, many people tend to villainize the species itself. But in the majority of cases, it's humans that have caused the problem. And that is definitely the case with the American mink. As today it can be found over many parts of Europe as well as South America. And one of the main reasons why they were imported into these continents is because of their fur. As unfortunately, many minks are caged for their entire lives just to be made into expensive clothing. And because of this trade, the American mink was first imported into Britain in 1929, but by 1956, there were many breeding populations in the wild. But as Britain is home to much larger otters, you'd think it would be hard for the American mink to spread. But this has definitely not been the case, as they're very much established, and even I've seen one of these guys in a river. One of the reasons why they've become so successful is that they don't directly compete with the otters, as although some otters are known to eat birds, the majority of their diet is made up by fish and crustaceans, whereas the mink is a more of an opportunistic feeder, and their smaller size also means it's easier for them to fit down burrows, and this has had disastrous consequences for the native water voles. And as these voles are easy prey for the mink, it's thought that they could go extinct if nothing is done to control the mink population. But as they're so widespread nowadays, this is a very hard job to do. And one of the only upsides of having this predator in British waters is that they also target other American invaders, such as the signal crayfish. So although it's not really the villain of the story, it is still a problem invasive species. But for our next species, we'll head to the cold water tributaries of the Pacific Ocean, as we have the rainbow trout. Now the rainbow trout is one of many trout that can be found in US waters, and was originally only native to the Pacific Rim from Mexico to Russia. But as I'm sure many of you know, this is not the case nowadays, as they have been introduced as both a food and a sport fish in at least 45 countries, and can now be found in every continent except from Antarctica. And because of the overwhelming spread of this species, it is included in the list of the top 100 globally invasive species. And as all trout have a very similar body shape and diet, usually feeding on smaller fish 
fish, crustaceans and insects. They are always in competition with each other, which means if they are introduced into an ecosystem where they don't belong, they compete with the native trout species and have a negative impact on their numbers, as the rainbow trout has a slight advantage over other species. As rainbow trout can withstand higher temperatures than other species of trout and are usually slightly hardier than other species, and as urbanisation and deforestation have raised the temperatures of rivers, it means that it's even easier for this fish to take over, and the rainbow trout has caused major problems in places where there aren't any other trout species, such as New Zealand and Australia, as they are a completely alien species in these waters and face no competition. So even though this is a very popular fish, it's also one of the worst invasive species in the world. But for our next species, we'll be moving over to the brackish waters of Eurasia, as we have the zebra mussel. Now this species is originally native to the lakes of southern Russia and Ukraine, but today the zebra mussels can be found in the fresh waters of North America, specifically the Great Lakes. And on the surface, it doesn't look very interesting at all, as mussels are not fast movers and mainly just lay on the substrate of rivers. But the zebra mussel is one of the most destructive species in the world, not only causing damage to the ecosystem, but also causing major damages to infrastructure. Now zebra mussels are filter feeders, normally filtering out detritus and tiny organisms from the water. It's thought that a zebra mussel can process up to one litre of water a day. And this filter feeding means that the water is normally a lot clearer in areas that have zebra mussels. And this increased clarity in the water has led to some species thriving, as the number of yellow perch has tripled in lakes where zebra mussels can be found. But although it's good for the yellow perch, the effects are catastrophic for almost everything else, as zebra mussels can attach to pretty much anything, from the substrate to the bottom of boats. And a female zebra mussel begins to reproduce within six to seven weeks of settling. And this female zebra mussel can produce 30,000 to 40,000 eggs each reproductive cycle. And this microscopic larvae floats on the currents and settles on any hard surface it can find. And each zebra mussel has a lifespan of around four to five years and is also very hardy, as zebra mussels can tolerate a wide range of environmental conditions and can even survive out of water for seven days. And this high reproductive rate and survival rate means that they can totally take over ecosystems. And this is especially bad for the native US mussels, as the zebra mussels are known to attach to them and completely suffocate them. And as the zebra mussel has very few predators in North America, there's almost nothing stopping them from spreading. It's thought that they originally got to the US by hitching on the ballast water of ships, but one other invader is thought to have travelled to America in this way, and that is the round goby. And I've already covered this species in the series before, but it's one of the few fish that actually feed on these mussels, even though it's a problem invasive species itself. And because of their ability to attach to almost anything, they are known to ruin boat engines and even clog up underwater piping, which causes millions of dollars of damage each year. But today, luckily, their numbers are slowly declining, so hopefully the zebra mussels won't be a problem for much longer. But for our next species, we'll be heading to the freshwaters of Europe and North America, as we have the sea lamprey. Now, there are quite a few species of lamprey, and surprisingly, not all of them are parasitic, although the sea lamprey is one of the parasitic species. And the sea lamprey is a very primitive fish and has one round sucker-like jawless mouth. And it uses this mouth to attach onto other fish and feed on the fluids and blood. And to do this, they have a nasty hook's tongue, which rasps away at the fish's flesh. And today, this horrific species is invasive over some of the Great Lakes. And this can cause major problems, as even if a fish survives a lamprey attack, they normally die soon after, if not from blood loss, then from infection. And it's thought that a single sea lamprey kills around 40 pounds of fish in its lifetime. And as I covered previously, the Great Lakes fisheries are worth a lot of money. But luckily, the sea lamprey is a migratory species, spending around two years of their life at sea. So to stop them returning to the Great Lakes, many physical barriers are put in place, which in recent years has limited their numbers. But as these same barriers can hinder trout and salmon species, chemical control methods are also put in place. And luckily today, this ill-like fish's numbers are mostly kept under control. But that's about it for this video. As always, if you know any more invasive species, then let me know down in the comments below. But thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you liked it, please leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more videos like these. But until next time, goodbye.